Second objective is to explain in general terms how the polarity of epithelial cells enables them to absorb or secrete materials, essentially how we have movement across the epithelial membrane. Now, transport across epithelium happens across two different membranes. So our epithelial membranes, and just to kind of backtrack here and explain what an epithelium is, these are the lining cells of all of our body surfaces. Epithelia lines our skin, it lines the internal surfaces of all our body cavities. So the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, all of our blood vessels are lined with epithelium. And so to have movement across these membranes really requires movement across the apical surface of the epithelium, as well as the basal lateral surface of that epithelium. And so when we talk about the epithelium, we're really talking about these epithelial cells. So cells that are lining one against each other, creating this continuous membrane. Now let's talk about some of the features of an epithelial cell. So it's got an apical membrane or an apical surface. This is the surface that's facing the lumen of that body cavity. So a good example here, let's think about the gastrointestinal cavity or the gastrointestinal tract. The lumen of that cavity is where we've got food content, so our biomolecules moving through the GI tract, whereas the undersurface of the epithelial cell is where we've got the interstitial fluid, the interstitial tissue, we've got the, the uh, endothelium here, which is lining the blood vessel that's under, underneath the cell. And so in order for transport to occur, we're saying that things have to move through the apical membrane from the luminal surface into the cell, and then again through the basolateral membrane from the inside of the cell into the interstitial fluid in order to be absorbed into our bloodstream. Some of the structures of the cell are also the tight junctions. So tight junctions are found in between one cell and another. This is really important in maintaining the integrity of the epithelial lining. And so it prevents any paracellular transport Paracellular transport is transport that could possibly occur in between the sides of the cell. And because we really don't want that, we want anything that moves from the lumen to the blood has to go through the cell itself to eliminate any paracellular transport. We've got these tight junctions in between one cell and the other. And for a clinical uh, reference or a clinical correlation here, if you've ever heard about leaky gut, so leaky gut is actual is an actual disorder or a group of symptoms that's associated with having loose or having um, injure to the tight junctions in between cells of the GI tract. And what this creates is an environment where fluid can leak in between the cells, creating things like constipation and diarrhea as actual symptoms. But then we can also have toxins and undigested food particles moving in between the cells and making their way into the underlying tissue. And that can certainly irritate or inflame the underlying tissue as well. So if you've ever heard of leaky gut syndrome, this is what happens when we have leaky gut, which is what we don't want in ideal circumstances. We wanna have nice tight junctions preventing any type of paracellular transport. As far as the basolateral membrane of the epithelial cell, we've got a couple of structures embedded in the membrane here. We've got the sodium potassium pump, we've got potassium leak channels, and then we've also got glucose carriers or facilitated carriers for glucose. So the sodium potassium pump, we would have talked about already. What type of transport is this, just as a review? Sodium potassium pump facilitates what type of transport? Active. Very active transport. Excellent. So primary active transport. So it's going to use that hydrolysis of ATP to move um, sodium and potassium against their gradients, respectively. And we can see that re reflected here by these red arrows. We've also got the sodium, the uh, potassium channels, the leak channels, which are moving passively. Okay, so these are just channels open up and moving according to potassium gradient out of the cell from high concentration to low concentration. We've also got these facilitated glucose carriers that are again, moving glucose according to its gradient, but we're using this transporter. Um, what type of transport is that? According to the gradient, but requiring a carrier. Facilitated diffusion? Yeah, excellent, thank you. So that's facilitated diffusion, which requires that glucose transport. 
So these are some of the uh, structures that we have embedded in the basolateral membrane to help facilitate that transport from the luminal surface into the underlying um, capillaries. On the apical surface of the cell, we've also got some other transport happening. We've got sodium leak channels that are leaking sodium according to its gradient. And then that is coupled to sodium linked glucose pumps, which are kind of borrowing that energy and moving glucose against its concentration gradient. Again, we spoke at length about this type of transport. This is gonna be secondary active transport, okay? So here are some actual examples of where we have these different types of transport um, facilitated by these different types of carriers that are embedded in the apical and basolateral membrane of the epithelial cell. Um, and so just to kind of explain a little bit here about the movement that's taking place, we've got sodium moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low intracellular concentration passively. And we're harnessing that energy to move glucose from an area of high concentration to an, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration inside the cell. So glucose is moving against its concentration gradient. And from there, we can now move glucose according to its concentration gradient from inside the cell to the interstitial fluid and eventually into the underlying capillary. And here, while we're moving according to the gradient, we're still requiring that GLUT4 transporter that's in the basolateral surface. So we can see here how all of these structures are playing together. The ICF-ECF concentrations of sodium and potassium are such that Sodium is higher outside the cell and lower inside the cell. Potassium is the opposite. It's higher inside the cell and lower outside the cell. And so this creates this perfect environment um, where we can leak potassium and use that energy on the apical surface. And then we can also leak potassium, excuse me, I said potassium. We can leak sodium and um, use that energy to move glucose against its gradient. And then we can have the opposite thing happening on the basolateral surface. We're pumping potassium out of the cell against its gradient. So we're actually keeping the relative intracellular and extracellular concentrations of sodium stable because so saves blah. Sodium is moving in both directions. I'm tying my words up today. Um, sodium is moving in both directions. So when what I'm trying to say here is we're not gonna build sodium up inside the cell or outside the cell because we have it moving both in and out of the cell respectively. So we're keeping those relative intracellular and extracellular um, concentration of sodium relatively stable, okay? Um, and then again, just kind of driving home the secondary active transport example being the um, co-transport of sodium and glucose, the facilitated diffusion example being the movement of glucose across the basolateral surface. Um, and so in this scenario, where is glucose concentration highest? So if we're moving glucose actively across the ap apical surface and passively across the basolateral surface, where is the higher concentration of glucose? Is it inside the cell or outside the cell? Okay, excellent. So a lot of response for inside the cell, and that is absolutely correct. So if we're moving it actively into the cell, then it must have a higher concentration inside the cell. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Um, the final thing that we're gonna speak about here is water transport across the epithelial membrane. So the way that water moves across epithelial surfaces is that we basically create this osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. So we basically pump solutes into the interstitial fluid, and then we pretty much create a gradient for water to simply follow via osmosis. So basically, we talked about the fact that water moves towards the solute. So from the lower solute concentration to the higher co solute concentration, 
Another way of thinking about that is from the higher water concentration to the lower water concentration. And so if we pump a bunch of solutes in one area, then we create a gradient for water to move towards those solutes as it moves from high to low water concentration. So that is the way that we facilitate the movement of water across epithelial surfaces is that we pretty much create an osmotic pressure where we pump a bunch of solutes actively from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And then we create this really salty or high solute concentration environment here. And then we simply have water really eager to move now from a lower water concentration in the lumen to a higher water, excuse me, from a higher water concentration in the lumen to a lower water concentration in the interstitial environment. Another way of looking at that is from a low solute concentration in the lumen to a high solute concentration in the interstitial fluid. So we essentially create a water gradient by pumping a lot of solute into this interstitial environment. And then the final uh, thing we'll discuss here is what happens if that doesn't happen effectively. This is a disorder called cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis happens when we have a defect in our active transport of solutes. And so we cannot create this water gradient. Normally we would be able to pump solutes so we can pump chloride actively into the lumen and we create this environment where we have a water gradient. This is for instances when we have water moving in the opposite direction. So I really wanna just clarify this. So this is how we absorb water from the luminal surface to the interstitial surface. This is how we absorb water into our bloodstream. This is how we actually move water in the opposite direction. And this is also important. This is called secretion. And this is important for things like creating mucus, mucus that's needed to lubricate the surface of the GI tract. Now, if we can't create effective pumping of these solutes, then we can't create the water gradient that's needed to make mucus. And so what we end up with is this really thick, viscous mucus lining our respiratory tract, lining even the uh, reproductive tract. And some of the symptoms that we see in patients with cystic fibrosis are really thick mucus leading to lots of respiratory dysfunction, as well as infertility because of that thick reproductive mucus, which um, prevents the passage or the traveling of the fertilized embryo. So if we cannot create this gradient, if we cannot actively pump solutes into the lumen, which happens to be the disorder, um, the underlying disorder of cystic fibrosis, then we cannot create the gradient that would facilitate the movement of water. And if we can't do that, then we end up with this really thick, cloggy, viscous mucus, which presents itself in a lot of other ways in our physiology, okay? All right, and then the last thing here is transcytosis. So transcytosis, we're gonna be speaking a lot about this type of movement. This is really the movement or transport of particles that are wrapped or engulfed in a membrane of its own. And so we've got two types of transcytosis. There's endocytosis, which is the engulfing or the swallowing of the particles through the apical surface. Um, and so this creates this little vacuole that has the particle inside of it. So we basically pinch off a part of the apical membrane and create a membrane for this particle or this molecule. It travels through the cell. And then the second part of the process here is exocytosis, where we kind of spit this particle out into the interstitial area. And then the membrane of the particle resumes as a part of the basolateral membrane of the cell. So transcytosis requires both endocytosis, which engulfs or takes the particle in and pinches off a part of the membrane to create a vacuole. And then it also requires exocytosis, which is basically spitting that particle into the other surface of the cell. And then the membrane that used to be a part of the vacuole now becomes a part of the basolateral membrane. We'll talk a lot about this. This is how neurotransmitters are um, moved across the synapse. So we're gonna talk a lot about this as a practical example in some of our future systems.